Hello everyone, now we're back. So let's now talk about Julia's type inference and the compiler, right? The reason is because compilation and the way that type inference is working really matters a lot for how our performance of our high-level high code will be, will be um, in, in the end. So we already saw that the compiler can be used in some fancy ways to be able to make things a lot cheaper, right? So you can, if you know beforehand that you want to do a bunch of different loops, you can fuse those all in together into one loop and decrease the amount of array allocations that are being done, right? So that's one, one way where building functions or, or compiling um, can be really helpful. But what I want to do here is I really want to explain a lot of the type inference algorithm and show you how this goes into to giving you multiple dispatch and how do you then start to use this effectively, right? Like, what does what does type inference mean? Why does it matter? It will come back to these ideas of of, st of the stack versus the heap, right? It, it really all will come back to these same ideas that we've been doing, but with an algorithm over it that is kind of predicting where things should be going or where things could be going. So the core to all of this is really type inference. Everything in your computer has a type. Right, and everything in, in Julia has a type as well. Why does everything in your computer have to have a type? Well, because when you just have a slab of memory, you have to know what those bits mean, right? And so, when when you're when you're building the thing, when you're building the stack, right? What what this thing is actually going to be telling it is, you know, it, it, like the compiler will will have given each part part of memory. Right, it knows by if it's this function, then the thing that is living in the fifth register of all those the next eight bits in there, or the next eight bytes in there, right? So a 64-bit object, that thing is something that you should interpret as a floating point number. And so if it's a floating point number, let's look at what that means. Right, there's some very good um, there's some very good uh, pictures of this all the time. Where's the picture I'm thinking of? That's that's the way that I always say. Where's the yeah? So you you know if if you have sixty four just little bits all lined up and you know that this thing is a is a floating point number, then you could take one of these things and know that this is going to be your mantissa and here's your exponent, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you have to know the type in order to know how to interpret what this sixty four bit string will actually mean, right? And so when when the stack is created. Uh, when, when the when the when the call stack for the function is created, it also has in there in the definition of its function what its different registers must mean, for so that way it can interpret all the values in the stack. For values in the heap, because they can actually be changing a lot, right? They're, they can be changing in size. They can also be changing in type. This this interpretation is something that is actually a flag. So when you, when you have this pointer, your pointer not only tells it where it is on, on the on the memory, but also it will actually either actually so the pointer just says where it is in the memory, but the first part of that piece of memory is not actually real memory. It's a flag telling it how to interpret the rest of the memory that comes after this. Right. So when when you have an array, you have a pointer which goes to a piece of memory. The first bit of that memory. Is something that tells your computer, hey, this is an array. It's an array of fit, of 64-bit floating point numbers, and then it starts right after that, right? Because you always you always have to know the type in order to even know what any of these bits mean. And you know, one one way to see that this is really essential is that you know, two in float 32. You know, if, if you were to create an array of 2f0, 2f0, this is also something that is 64 bits. And so you have to know what the type is going to be between, because otherwise you can interpret this as one number or two numbers, right? Um, so everything always has to have a type, and your computer all the time, anytime it's accessing memory, it's having to put an interpretation on those bits. And so it has all the, it either is getting that from the function itself or from the tag that is associated with the, with the memory. So how does the function actually know what the types of the thing is going to be? Well, let's let's take a look at a C function. Well, double is in, in C, what double means is float 64. So this says this is an array of float 64s, this is an array of float 64s, this is an array of float 64s, and then this is a size t object. So this is a essentially an integer um, that's going to tell me the arrays of the, uh, the size of the ends. 
So the reason, the way that, that a function can compile in C, so that way it can know all of the different sizes is, well, it, you, you, you tell it exactly what the types are for everything. Right. And this is how it's enabled to optimize. It knows what the types of all these things are, it, which means it knows that the it knows that the value that comes out of here has to be a 64-bit number. And so what comes out of here has to be a 64-bit number. And so what the compiler will do is it'll change this so that way it has a value, and then it'll put the value inside of the array, and it will know that this value can be stack allocated because it is going to be something that's 64 bits. So it puts a spot in the function call stack, which is, which allows it to be, have this little cache that it can grab from in the stack. And this is how it's all working, right? So it needs to know all this information about what the type of the array is and what the types of the things coming out of the array are in order to be able to do these, these orderings and be able to keep this thing on the stack. Now, when you do this in Python, what does this actually mean? Well, you know, it says A becomes this object where if I was to check the value, it'll be two. If B is the object where if I was to check the value, it becomes four. And what the interpreter will do is when it sees that it wants to do a plus, it'll check what the current value of A is, right? It'll go into the heap because this is an object. And the first thing in this object is it'll tell it what its type is. So it'll use that to go get its value and it'll propagate that up. It'll use that to go get its value, propagate that up, use that to figure out what, how it should be doing plus, and then it'll plus those two values together. And this is why this is type checking at runtime, right? Anytime you want to do plus or anytime you want to do an operation on this memory, because operations require that you know how to interpret the memory, it needs to check these flags to be able to know what to do each time. And so you could probably guess that that's going to be expensive, right? And so this is where a lot of these runtime overheads for an interpreter comes from, from actually having to, to do, all, do all these guesses and checks for what all these values should be or what all these memory pieces should be. So the Julia solution is really a hybrid, right? So the C solution basically says A is going, you, you, you say in here, right, that A is going to be a, a, um, a vector of floating for, of 64-bit integers or 64-bit floating point numbers. And if I was to try to put something that is a 128-bit object in there, it will just fail. And Python is in the whole other direction where here this is a 64-bit integer. But you know what? If I want to make A be um, something that is a 32-bit floating point number, why not? Why don't I just change it around all the time? Because it's always on the fly at this, whenever it's doing a function call, it's going to check what the type is. It's OK to keep on changing your types around because it will know what to do. It, it, will, ha it will have to do this, this check, right? That che check will cost something. But it will know how to handle these type changes, whereas the C function will not. So Julia kind of falls in the middle. So when you write down this function in Julia, right, so your, your function looks like this. And it seems like it, when it's running in the REPL, it's going to do something very similar to Python because it can't know that you, when you're changing the type of A, it can't know when you're changing the type of B. And so it will, you know, whenever it does a function call, it's going to have to check what the types are. But when it's inside of a function, it can start to deduce what's going on, right? So what, what does that actually look like? Well, let's, let's define a function f of x plus y, right? And so when it does a function call, the thing that pretty much always happens with Julia is it's going to specialize, in, it's going to specialize the function that it's actually generating and calling based on the types of the input. So let's uh, let's use interactive utils here. Actually, I don't need to do this if I'm working directly in the REPL. So what code LLVM is going to do is this is going to kick out the LLVM code. The pre this this is a form of the compiler code that's going to tell me what kind of assembly is being created. So what kind of what uh so what, in in more detail LLVM is the Julia compiler. This is the intermediate representation for the, for the LLVM compiler, which is uh, agnostic to the hardware that we have underneath. So LLVM, basically what happens is you go from Julia code to LLVM IR, and then LLVM translates this to the compiled code per architecture. Right, so, so L, the, the, what IR means is intermediate representation, so it's this compiled representation that is still free from the actual hardware details. Um, 
And, and there's some good reasons for that, right? Because that means that the people who are writing Julia in its compiler don't have to worry about the difference between an ARM chip, you know, the thing that's in an iPhone, and a, you know, an x80, x86 uh, chip that's made by Intel, right? All these things will have the same LLVM intermediate representation, even though their native assembly code will be different. So let's look at what this thing actually looks like. So here is the LOVM representation of this function that I'm wanting to compile. And immediately what we see is that this defines a function which outputs an integer 64-bit uh, integer, which takes in a 64-bit integer and a 64-bit integer. Right? What does this function actually do? Well, you have this, this spot in your chip which is adding 64-bit uh, 64 64-bit integers. And so this is going to do that operation between the uh, value 2 and value 1, right? And that's going to be our temporary thing that would go onto the stack and is going to return that temporary. So this is what this LLVMIR means. Now notice that this is something that only works on 64-bit integers. So you might want to ask the question of what happens if you try to call that function on a, something that doesn't have a 64-bit integer. You get a different function. All right, so this is what we mean by type specialization. Julia is building different functions for the different types that go into the function. All right, so here, this function takes in a double and a in 64, right? This double, remember, is the same thing as C. Um, the first thing that it does is it takes the, you know, it takes this input right here, this, this uh, one, and what it will do is it will change it from an in 64 to a double. Right, so it takes this value, converts it to a double. After it does that promotion, then it will do a floating point add between the converted value and the input value. This gives us our new temporary value, and this is what it returns. And so this is a function which is optimized. Right, there's, there's no type checks in here at all. It, will, it is perfectly optimized, right? just like F0 to handwritten that C code is perfectly optimized for a double comes in and a integer comes out. And just for clarity, let's do this last piece. We have a double and a double. And so here, when we have two doubles come in, there is no type checking at all, because it will just see that it has two doubles, and it will do a floating point add between this value and this value, and output the re return of that. Right. So each time that you change the types that are going to your function, there is a different function that's compiled. So what is the level at which compilation is happening then? It is the types of a, that go into a function, right? So if we look at this function, and if we look at this function, those two are the same function, right? They change the name just because I'm asking it for, you know, give me the LLVM right and it's going to give me a unique one each time. But other than the name of this function, this is exactly the same function. So when, when we do this, Right, so we can actually see this, this compiler lag here, right? because when you do the first call here, um, let me actually uh, do this call again. Um, let's see, let me just start a new REPL. So I did control J, control K to kill, um, control J, control C to uh, clear my REPL, and I want to just start fresh so that way I have no compiler cache. And um, so here I define f, and now here let me time f. Ooh, it does not have, it's compiling everything away. That is, that is a new thing, that it is compiling all that away. Okay, um, Well, then, that is nice and, and not nice at the same time. Alrighty then. Well, so what happens when, when you call this function is that um, the first time that you call it here is going to compile. Let me see if I actually did the... No, I didn't, I didn't show it here. But the, so the first time that you call the function is going to compile. The second time you call the function, it's already going to be compiled. And when you change the values, this, fun this function as well is already going to be compiled. Because remember, 
this code and this code are exactly the same code, right? So the the functions that you're building and the functions that are being called are functions that are dependent on type information. It uses everything that it can know of from a type to be able to compile the function, and that function can be used then for different values. So type information is compile time information and values such as the values inside of an array the actual value of the floating point number that is runtime information you can specialize on the type information you cannot specialize a function on the runtime information and so the way that, that Julia then works here is that because it uses types as the way that it makes things fast Let's see what actually happens inside of this function, right? So um, for a equals four, b equals two. Now we do f, which is x plus y. We do that between x and a. We do that between b and c. And we do that between d and y. Okay. Very simple function. What does the code look like? Well, all that it boils down to is it's going to do a integer add. An integer, and then it's going to do an integer add, and then it's going to return, right? Because integer add, integer add, and return. Looks like it actually deleted one of my... Um, so compilers are very fancy. They can even delete stuff for you. Aha. So do you actually see where the deletion was? So instead of adding 4 plus, plus 2, what it's actually realized is that 4 plus 2 equals 6. And so it's going to take my input here, it's going to take the input, add 6 to it, and then it's going to take that thing and it's going to do this plus this, you know, all these three added together, plus this other input value is what I return. All right, so it's, it's being a little bit fancier than, than just calculating three adds. It's actually going to, at compile time, work on this constant value. So that, that's a fun little thing that we can see directly by looking at the, um, the generated code. But the other thing here is that it, that it had to have found out that everything is an in integer, right? Because we know that the input's an integer and an integer. Well, we know that this value is going to be an integer because we can see right here, if it's a equals 4, it's this constant integer, right? Um, b equals 2, con this constant integer. Uh, c equals f of x plus a. Well, we know that, like, remember, let's, let's look back at this code again. And the f, when it's called on an integer and an integer, it spits out an integer. So it knows that if this is an integer and if this is an integer, then what comes out of here is an integer. What comes into, out of here is an integer, right? And so what, what this is called is this, this is the type inference algorithm. It's going through and it's saying if these things are integers and these things are integers, then, B's, then C is an integer, D is an integer, and your return's an integer. We can actually see the typed version of our code um, by looking at at code typed. So here is the, so there, there's a lowering stage inside of Julia, which is the typed code. And so here we can actually look at that, where the pi, is, so a pi node is something that holds onto a constant. So here's a compiler constant of four. Um, here's our compiler constant of two. And so the way that Julia actually is representing our function is it takes in the values two and five, it then it puts this uh, this this compiler constant of four. It does an add between this input x and this compiler constant. Then it takes this compiler constant two and it does the output here between this compiler constant. But the key here is it's 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 found this type information. It has figured out that you know the the addition of these two values is going to give out an integer, and so it will now type this new value with an integer. It can keep on pushing that through, right? Because once you found out that c is an integer, if you know that b is an integer, then you can also deduce that d is an integer. And so this is this type inference algorithm pushing the types all the way through. Um, it actually is kind of a fixed point of code where what it does is it runs through and it pushes the values as far as it can and repeats it, repeats it, repeats until it's trying to find out exactly um, all the types of the full code. Um, so yeah, so we could, we could look at one of these more complicated cases. So code typed um, is a way to be able to look at the code with the inference in here. Um, there will be something that we'll mention in a second called type instability, which is, well, if it cannot figure out a type, then we have what's called a type instability. And so you can also use this at code warn type, which will basically just make it red if it doesn't, if it sees a type it, it didn't infer. 
So this is another nice way of, of looking at the Julia version of the code. Right, so here uh, we have g, which is a compiler constant. So g is a function. The function is a compiler constant of itself. And so our inputs are x, which is a floating point number, and y, which is, a which is an integer. The first thing that it does is it defines a and b to be these integers. And then it figures out that c has to be a floating point number because it is going to be doing a floating point number plus an integer. Remember how, what the code for that, that's generated is. It, it uh, turns this into a floating point, then it adds it, right? And then that means that we have another float. C is a floating point number, so D becomes a floating point number. So the output becomes a floating point number. So, okay, so this type inference algorithm can figure out these things like promotions and, and things like that, and it can just push through all these types. So it can't always push through all the types, right? Because remember, there's there's two sets of information. There's type information, which we know at compile time, and there is runtime information, which is the value of the objects. So let's look at this function h of xy. So h of xy is, well, what we do is we add x plus y, and then if this random number is less than 5, then we output out. Otherwise, we output float64 of out. So what is the type? Well, the type of the output is float64, comma, int64, because you don't actually know what the output's going to be, right? Because you have no way, from given the type information, right, you know that this is an integer, you know this is an integer. So out is going to be integer plus integer. This is an integer. So therefore, you know, this is a floating point value, and this is a less than. This is a floating point value. So this is a Boolean. But you don't actually know whether this Boolean is true or false, right? You only know that it is a Boolean because this type information is Boolean, not true, right? That, that true is runtime information. So whether, or whether you get an integer or a float64 is dependent on the values of your program. And so this is something where the, the compiled code, the best that it can do is create is say that the u is going to be one of these two types. It's going to be a floating point number, or it's going to be an n64. It makes this red for you because it, that means that it wasn't fully inferred. And it, what it does is it compiles this function, which has an if statement in here. And dependent on the value, it can run between these two pieces of the code. Right. Let's actually look at what happens if this is something that's fully inferable. So let's say one is less than two. Right. So here, this is something where, you know, now we have compiler constants. So compiler constants are something that we know their value at compile time because we've actually written the literal value in here. And so the compiler can access this and know what that this is always going to be uh, true. And so it actually is going to figure that out. And so it's going to say there is actually there is actually no if statement here, right? Because if the if the value if it's always going to be false, then there's no if statement anymore. I'm just going to always run this part of code right here. All right. And so, um, or actually other way around, right? If this is always true, then you're always going to run this part of the if statement. So if, it, so if you can use compiler constants, you can, here's an example of it compiling away code, but here's an example where it is completely dependent on runtime values, which type you'll have. And so, the generated code cannot be something that is specialized for in 64s or float 64s it has to be specified it has to be specialized on either in 64 or float 64 which is what this union type is for if we look at this code llvm you'll see this actually in action right so let's 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 blow this up a bit so why is this so big all of a sudden well remember remember how i described um, re remember how I described what happens when you have these type instabilities, right? Like in, in Python or, and such. You have to start checking these flags whenever you start running into, well, actually this, this has another salient reason in there. Um, it seems to have inline the random function, and so a lot of this function is actually the random 
but another you you also will always see much larger codes when you when you have a type instability because it needs to start checking the types right so you, you have all these operations in there of getting the int pointer to be able to check what's at the front of it the reason why it's checking the front of it is because it's checking the flag to then figure out what the type is to then be able to call julia's compiler to be able to find what operation to do right so the compiler code when you have type instabilities or at least here when you have random in there um, it's going to be a lot more difficult to read Here's what it was like before it started uh, putting the random in there. So let me just kind of paste this in here. It is still something that is fairly difficult to read. So th this really tells us that like the, the core of this language, right? So the, the way that C++ or Fortran works is that you have to tell it exactly what these types are and then the compiler is able to build efficient code, right? Julia, on the other hand, is what it's doing is it takes a look at the, the function, the, the um, types that come in, and it sees that if it can, st it looks at and starts to try to deduce what types will come out and tries to push that all the way through a function. So that way this whole function as a block or this whole function as a block will all compile together and all optimize together based off of whatever comes in here. But that means that really the, the, the key to the way that Julia kind of looks like Python is that it is changing the actual function that is calling under the hood dependent on the types that come in. So that means every single type is actually building a new, uh, a new actual code that is calling, right? And that is actually then the basis for the core fundamental uh, property of the language, which is multiple dispatch. So multiple dispatch it usually is introduced as a feature, right? So here, what I can define a function, which is ff on an integer and an integer, and now it means uh, 2x plus y, and now ff on a floating point number and a floating point number is x divided by y. And so if I do f of 2, 5, this should be 2 times 2 plus 5, which equals to 7. Two times two uh, plus five, which equals nine, because we know math. Um, and now uh, two point zero and five point zero is going to give you a completely different value because this is calling this function because it has integers that come in, and this is calling this function because floating point numbers come in. Right. So this is you know Julia's multiple dispatch. This is really one of its defining. This is probably its defining feature. You know, and a lot of people think about this as you know. The, you know, Julia is not object oriented because it is multiple dispatch oriented. And we'll show, you know, this kind of leads to a multiple dispatch style. But the reason why this is really the case is because the way that it's built up as a fast language on top of a JIT compiler is it's all based around the way that it changes the functions that it lowers to dependent on types. So multiple dispatch is actually just a very natural relation where you're now just exposing that to the user, right? You're now saying, as the for user, you're now allowed to tell Julia how it should be generating new functions um, based off the types. And this is actually done all the way down. So Julia, at its very base, when Julia opens up, it actually the first things it defines are integers and floating point numbers. Those are defined within the language itself. And then what it does, so the way that it actually works is it does plus of x float 64 and y float 64, it says that this is some LLVM call, right? So it actually just writes in the LLVM at, at the lowest level. So it, it tells it, you know, like what, what operation it should be doing, but that is still something that is actually defined in the Julia programming language itself. It's not built into the compiler. Um, so even floating point arithmetic. So all of all those specializations all the way down are things that are written in the Julia language by using multiple dispatch. And so this is just it at its highest level as a feature but really what you can understand then is multiple dispatch is not really just a feature. This is actually the core way that the compiler is actually building optimized code for the inputs because it is now, it's able to use this to essentially deduce what the C code would be given the input types, right? Because, you know, when, when it finally is at this, this highest level, right, this code LLVM that it's outputting is almost the same thing that you would have wanted to generate if you, if you were writing C code, except now it's able to know how to do this because 
FF on integers is different than um, FF on integers is different than FF on float 64s, which is then going to call the specialized version for um, plus between an integer and integer, and it's going to call the specialized version a multiply for integer and integer. And so if you can then start to push through all these types, right, if you have type inference that tells you what all the types will be, then you can figure out exactly which function you're going to be calling all the way along. And then you can create this ultra optimized version, which is essentially a function that only would have worked on integer values, compile that, and that's the one that you run. All right, so type inference and multiple dispatch really are the two things that work together to make this thing be fast. Um, and then, the uh, so, so the, I mean, so th this is why we're kind of using Julia here, because it, g it gives us a very nice tool to be able to get things that are a lot like the C function, but are generic, right? So it's generic to this works on float32 values, it works on float64 values, so we're not writing a whole bunch of code. Um, if you're familiar with C++, this style of writing a generic function and having it compiled multiple ways is is very close to uh, template programming. There is actually there there's a, there is a small difference. I'm not going to get into. Um, if you if you want to see a little bit more on that. Um, you should look at the video, which is the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch. This uh, this this talk by one of the Julia compiler developers is a very good example that goes through what, what how is it similar to some things like template programming? How is it different from template programming? And goes through a bunch of different examples. So if you want all those details, please check out uh, this video, unreasonable effectiveness and multiple dispatch. But um, this, this is exactly why when we write a function and we, when you're using Julia at a high level, it looks a lot like Python, but it actually runs a lot like C. Well, because it's actually building code, which is almost exactly the C code because of type specialization and inference underneath the hood. All right, so if, if you look at something, um, so even all the way down to the way that plus works between different numbers, this is a piece of Julia code defined in the compiler which calls promote between x and y. Then we can ask, for example, at what is this code doing between promote of 2.0 and 5? You can then see that this is something that's also defined in Julia, which is calling a, a much more primitive promote. And you can dig down all the way to all, all the way until you get down to someone having written a piece of LLVM um, inside of the function. So, th so there's nothing that is hidden within the compiler, right? The, everything that was done to make things fast is exposed to you, and it's really just this this idea of if you want to make your algorithms fast, you have a different algorithm for float 32s, a different algorithm for float 64s, etc. But you can have a compiler kind of generate those different variants, right? Because two two x plus y is going to be optimal for not just integers, but it's going to be um, optimal. The, uh, this is the optimal way to write it on N32s, right? Why is that optimal on N32s? Well, because someone already wrote the optimal way for doing plus or multiply, uh, optimal way for doing plus. And so you don't need to worry at this level, like how do I make sure that it calls the optimal version of all those functions underneath the hood? That is just multiple dispatch, recursively doing multiple dispatch, recursively doing multiple dispatch, right? And, and so then you get something that is fully specialized at the top level without worrying too much. Though you can start to use this in your mathematical algorithms um, to be able to create new matrix types and things, and, and we'll get into that. But th so this is really how it's working. And when you do this, this operate when you define ff of x y equals two x plus two y, right? What this is actually doing is this is defining the version which is x equals any, and y is any. Right, where any is something that is, if you take the type of anything, it is something that is subtyping any. So, so now we can see that we start to have this type tree, right? You have this tree where you have uh, a number is an abstract type, and you know underneath this abstract type you have complex and you have real. Underneath uh, real you have abstract float. Abstract float has these concrete types, right? So here you have a concrete type of float 16, float 32, float 64, and big float. Um, so 
what the, the way that multiple dispatch will work is it will disambiguate it will disambiguate different calls by trying to choose the lowest level. So here I've defined flow 64, flow 64. I can also define flow 64 and number to be you know 2x. And so when I call FF on 2.0, 5.0, Right, this is flow 64 and this is flow 64, so it's going to call the version that is lowest. But when I change this to be float 64 and uh, float 32, it no longer matches this one. And so it looks what's what's just a little bit higher. And so what's just a little bit higher here is float 64 number. And um, let me see if I can quickly think of an uh, of another example here. So, so yeah, so let, let me now try something else, like uh, uh, what if I do 2F0 and 5F0, then, well, what does it, what did this end up calling? Well, I have this any here, right? So this is going to call, um, this is going to be 2X plus 2Y, so this is 2 times 2 plus uh, 10, which is equal to 14, right? So it goes to the first one above that matches. So uh, just to show what happens, what if nothing matches, right? So 6xy equals 2.0x, uh, where I make this be a float 64 and anything. And now I do um, g of uh, 2f0, right? So maybe you didn't mention this. Whenever I do this f, this is just giving me a 64-bit, uh, or this is giving me a 32-bit floating point number. 2f0 and 2.0, 2 this is going to be, oh darn it, it's calling the wrong g. Um, let me try to quickly come up with it. How many of these did I come up with? Um, h, let's do j. I'm going to have to just get a clean REPL here in a second. So here it says uh, no method matching j of float32, float64, because the, all of the methods that I have is, well, I've only defined what happens when I have an well, float64 first, and so there's just no functions it knows how to call. Right? So the function is dependent on the input types, and here I said that the only method that exists is one that has float64 as for the first value, so there's no value for this, to, no word for this to call, and so this throws an error. Now, there is a, another case that can happen. Let me kill my REPL because now I have a bunch of, I have named a whole bunch of things F and FF at this point. So I need to kind of just start over here. Um, so here, let me do FF, which is between the float 64 and a number is 5x plus 2y. FF between a number and an integer is x minus y. So now let's do FF between 2.0 and 5. Ooh, and it doesn't know what to do, right? Why does it not know what to do? Well, because if I do a float 64 and a integer, right? So what's, what's lower here? Float 64 and number or integer and number? Both of these match. Both of so this one is tighter, you know, number is tighter, float 64 is tighter than number, and integer is tighter than number. And so they're both tighter in different ways. So it's ambiguous which one is actually lower in some sense. And so what this method error is saying is that you have an ambiguity, right? So the, this, this call right here is ambiguous um, between these two different function calls. In order to fix this, um, one way to do that would be to find this function, right? So you have to say, if you're lower than both of the, if you're lower than both this type over here and this type over here, then what I want you to do is 2x minus y. And you have to tell it that to be able to disambiguate that case. And now, uh, what what this type inference and multiple dispatch starts to do is it means that the things that start coming out of the functions, or or the type information on what will come out of functions, really starts to matter. So, let's look back at our array friend. Right, we have array, which is this array, which is a vector of flow sixty four. The so type of a is a vector of flow sixty four. What this means, you know, the reason why we have this, we don't just type this as a vector, but as a vector of float 64, is because remember, indexing is a function call, and what is the what is the type that's going to come out of this function? Well, you can the compiler can know that at 
compile time, it knows what kinds of things are inside of this vector. So the only thing that can come out of here is a flow 64. That's how it's then able to do type inference on algorithms that have arrays. Now let's see what happens when we have a vector of any. There are two things that happen here, right? So the first thing is you no longer know that every single object is 64 bits, right? Here we know that everything is 64 bits, so we actually know the size of this. So this means we can have one slab of memory where everything is a 64-bit slot and jump to the right slot. In this case, you can have anything, right? You can't actually know how much memory you need between all of the values. So how can you actually handle this case where you might have a string and a string can be a gigantic string and so it can take more memory? Well, you can have a pointer which points to an array of pointers where each pointer is pointing to a whole thing of memory. Right, and so that's actually how this thing is, is represented. It's a, it's a pointer to the array of pointers, which is pointed to the memory. Um, which should probably tell you right away that this is probably not going to be the most performant way to do calculations. Let's see what happens when we do add code form type on this bad container. So, uh, well, this container is actually good. So on the on this container, right, so base.getIndex, remember getIndex, when you call a of 2, this is actually just a function call. So getIndex of a at the second thing, so it's actually using this as a compiled constant. What comes out of there is a float64, because a is something where it knows everything that comes out is a float64, right? Now what happens when we do this with b? Well, you, we, know what the, what we know what the types are in here, because we know the runtime information. The compile time information is only that you have a vector with anything in there. So at compile time, the only thing that can be deduced is that b of 2 is going to have whatever can come out of here, which can be anything. And so, boom, when you do get index of b with 2, you see that the only, they cannot deduce anything about the type that comes out, and therefore anything is the type that comes out. So this is actually one of the most salient ways to kind of start to destroy your performance, right? Because you want to build functions that act like C by having functions that have the right information to be a C function. If you don't have type information, you don't have the information to build such a function. So let's say we have a vector of number, right? So number is an abstract type, which can be float32, float64, all these different things. So that means that when we do a get index, the thing that comes out of there is a number. And when we do the next operation, well, it can probably, it can be anything, right? Because there's a whole bunch of different numbers. Some numbers can even give you errors as outputs or things like that, right? So this can be anything. And so what comes out of here is, what comes out of this point is another number, but when we add it again, we get anything. And so this is how you can see where how type inference blows up, where the output of here can be anything because the, the part that made this become basically anything is that we just on, the only thing that we know about what comes out of x is it's just some number type. We don't know we don't know its bit size anymore and so we can't we can't even stack allocate c because we don't know if it's going to be 32 bits, we don't know if it's going to be 64 bits, 128, we don't know if it's going to be an entire array, right? If we don't really know what kind of number x is, there's not enough information to be able to specialize enough. Um, And so let, let's actually uh, do some timings on that. So if I do using benchmark tools, and I do at b time q of x, oh, actually I haven't defined f yet, so let's just do f of x, y equals x plus y. Let's do some timing here. Um, so x is this array, and I get three allocations, and I'm having a bunch of allocations because um, it doesn't. Even though these are scalars, these scalars have to go to the heap because it is unknown at compile time what their size will be. So now let's actually look at x equals 1.0, 3.0, where this is now strictly typed. If we do at b time q of x, it's able to deduce the types at each step of the way, and is a much faster algorithm. What is this one allocation? Well, that allocation is actually the, the value that is returned from the function having to go onto the heap, which is the REPL. 
right? Because the REPL is actually something in Julia. And so it has a global state and that state lives on the heap. And so when you return from a function, that value can go on the heap unless you return nothing. Right? So when we had those non-allocating functions, that's one of the reasons why I did a, a nothing on the end there, because then you can make sure you get zero allocations. Here, we actually have an allocation due to the output itself, but that's usually not a big deal at all. So one, th one thing that, that, that can come out of this then is that if you can know, you, you can start to see how you can deduce a lot of information directly from, um, directly from the bit sizes, right? So if you're to take something like float64, well, in Julia, if you, you will find out that you can do primitive type and you can do something like uh, float64 and you say that this is a 64 bits, right? So this is actually how this primitive type is defined in, in Julia. This is nice because uh, one case where I know that this is actually used by library writers is in um, bio.jl, where the bioinformatics libraries, right, they, they define their own primitive types for, um, for the ACGT, right, for, for DNA bases, because you don't want to use a whole string. Strings can, ca can have a whole bunch of values in there, whereas AGCT is something that can only have, you know, two bits can represent that, or you can have four, four values out of DNA um, be inside of one byte, right? So eight, eight bits. Um, so, so, w w what is I saying there? Yeah. So, um, you can define these primitive types yourself, and that can be useful. But you can also, whether it is actually primitive, can be something that's deduced by looking at whether it is also just only, but only built upon by deducible primitive types. So here float64 is in what's known as an is bits type. And so now let's define our own number. Like so here's my complex number, which has a real part and an imaginary part, right? So this part is 64 bits because it's a float64. This part is a, is here we're defining we're, we're defining this in such a way such that it knows at compile time that this is always going to be a float64. This is always going to be a float64. So how many bits is this complex number? Well, it's 128. And so the Julia compiler is able to tell you that this is an is bits type, right? So even though it is not defined as a primitive type, this is a type that is represented by 128 bits. It is not an object with a pointer to two things. It is a slab of 128 bits on, in memory that is kept intact because it is just something that is two 64-bit numbers uh, strewn together. So if you want to define your own number type, all you have to start to do is you just have to tell it some of its primitive operations. So for example, what is the addition between my complex and a my complex? Well, you just do complex number arithmetic, right? What, is, what do we want to do when we do addition between a complex number and an integer? Then we just add the integer and we carry forward the, real, uh, the imaginary part. And we can do that in the other way around, right? So we define enough operations. We can start to use our complex number as though it's just any built-in number. Um, how do we have g defined? So let's define this generic function here. Right, and so uh, when we call g on my complex 1.0, 1.0, my complex 1.0, 1.0, it knows that the output is a my complex, one, uh, my complex of a 8 and 2. And what does this code actually look like? Well, this code, right, it knows that the input is a my complex and the y is a my complex. It knows a is an integer, b is an integer. So this is addition between an integer and a, and a my complex, which puts out a my, my complex. The you, know, you, can, you can see how you can just start to push through all the values. And so even on, on our function that we just defined here on our own number type, it knows exactly the number of bits for every single portion along the way. And so all of these things are stack allocated, and this is an efficient function, right? Because we've given the compiler enough information to be able to know the bit sizes and know the types of everything along the way. We can actually look at the code that it's generating. And the code that it's generating is simple. Uh, let, let's, let's look at this a little bit. So the code that it's generating here, right? So it, it, this, I'll, I'll go into what this means. So this is a vector operation. It's actually doing multiple, it's doing two different additions at, or two different multiplications at the same time. 
Um, so it is going to be doing a two multiplications at the same time, two, two multiplications at the same time, or no, no. So it is, it's going to be grabbing two values, grabbing two values, and then doing the addition against the 2.0. It's going to be grabbing the two values, and then it's going to be doing two, two operations at a time, and then it's going to be outputting these two. Right. So it's, it really is keeping this thing intact as 128 bits and realizing that it can do all of its operations with two 64-bit numbers all at the same time. So this is even faster than just you know having written out if, if something on the floating point uh, on the real part and the imaginary part. It's actually doing the computations with the floating point and or with the real part and the imaginary part inside of the same floating point register simultaneously. So this is actually something that we call SIMD or single input multiple data, which is a form of processor level parallelism. Right, so we're already getting parallelism just because of this operation, and the requirement for that is really just that it knows how many, it just needs to know that it's going to be doing two floating point operations um, in sync, and it needs to know that it's, it needs to know exactly where those values are going to be and what their sizes are. And we satisfy those, those constraints, and so it's able to utilize the, this special part of, the of, the, of our computer chip to be able to start fusing these operations together. So this means that whenever we're doing these operations, you have one floating point operation that does two multiplies, which you're having the amount of time. You're not truly having the amount of time in, in your computation because SIMD actually is a little bit slower, but you're getting close to two times faster. So yeah, so this is, this is where we can start to see that code generation can be something that really beats even if you're to write your own assembly code because you might not have even known to use that specific register of, of, of floating points or of the FPU. So the problem with this version of my complex is that it only works on 64-bit floating number, point numbers. Um, so how can we make a version of a complex number which works for any types of inputs but is still specializing all the way in the compiler? This is the parameterized form. And so here what I'm saying is when, when, you, when you define what this type parameter is, you know that your, that your real value and your imaginary value have to match that type. And so my parameterized of complex 1.0, 1.0 is a my parameterized complex of float 64. And so if you, have, if you have this full knowledge that is a my parameterized complex of float 64, then you will know that this is something that has 64 bits, 64 bits, 128 bits, and so this is once again an is bits type. You can define these operations, right, and it will know the optimized way to do this addition, the optimized way to do this addition, right, because it is just doing multiple dispatch, it's recursively doing that, and so the, all of these operations will be just as efficient, and parameterize my complex is just as efficient as this version that we had before. So parameterizing your, your, your types is a nice way to be able to get this flexibility um, along with, you get the flexibility along with the, um, the speed. Like really what's going on here is that you shouldn't think about a parameterized type as one type. Instead, this is one type, this is another type, and you've just written it in a way where you can create this whole family of types really easily. And how does it know that this should be a float, um, my complex of float, uh, float 64? Well, because when this is a compile time constant, this is a compile time constant, it can push through the constants. So it really just is pushing as much information all the time. So here we can look at the code one type. Right, so it's saying that when I have float 64s come in, it deduces that everything's going to be float 64 arithmetic. When I have uh, float 32s come in, it deduces that everything is float 32 arithmetic, right? Because it does the promotions, it pushes through the integers as float 32s, and it just does each of the computations along the way. So now let's define my slow complex because we want to just see what happens if we don't have type information. So my slow complex, it can have a real, which can be anything. Right? So this is, this is equivalent to having put any. 
So it can have anything here, it can have anything there. So is it a bits type? False, because you don't actually know the number of bits, which means that now it can't be something that's stored as just the thing in memory with the exact number of bits. It needs to be a pointer to pointers that have the real value and the imaginary value. We can still make this thing work, right? So we can define the same overloads, and this thing will now work inside of G. It's just my slow complex would just be building new my slow complexes, right? So in some sense, this is type stable, but this type, it's, you know, because it knows what the type will be at every state, it just has absolutely no clue what real and imaginary will be. So inside of each of these additions, it's going to be type unstable. So we can see that in action here, where even though it's type stable, all of these, all these extra operations, these mem sets, what, what these are doing is it's getting the element pointer to be able to search for what the, you know, it's going, this is it going through the pointers to pointers, be able to fi figure out what type it actually is right there and it's going to cast it into the type before it actually calls the correct function on that object, right? So it, before every single time, before it does an operation, it needs to go figure out what's there, it needs to then uh, find out what function to call, and then it calls that function on the current runtime types. So all of the type information, it still needs it to do, to do the correct interpretation, right? It's just getting all that type information at runtime. Um, and so that's going to be a lot slower. So let's, let's actually time this out here. At B time here versus at B time, my parameterized complex. So here, th this one is, is one nanosecond, which is it's still optimizing something somehow. Um, but the other one, it's actually just completely optimized away all the operations. Um, this is actually faster than a call to your floating point register. It actually just kind of knows that this is, if, if this is all considered compile time information in the function here, it's just deduced everything. So let me let me actually make it so that way it can get rid of that, right? Let's not have that be compile time information, so that way it cannot specialize on exactly the values that I'm putting in here. And so here it's actually having to do calculations now. So now it's 22 nanoseconds, whereas the my slow complex version. So you do have to be careful with the optimizing compiler, right? Because you have to be very careful that you're not timing the thing that is actually optimized away all of your calculations. So let me do the my slow complex. And you can see that it's about five times slower. And it has more allocations. What are those allocations? Those allocations are because every single my, my slow complex has to allocate because it doesn't actually know its bit size, right? It's no longer in its bits type. Um, and so it cannot live on the stack, it has to live on the heap. Now what about my slow complex too, right? So this is giving you some type information. It just says it's an abstract float. Is this is bits? Well, no, because, right, we already know that there's float 16, float 32, float 64, and so there's no way to, even though you know that it's a floating point number, you still don't know the bit size. You still don't have enough information to be able to, to work on this thing. So this is still going to be slow, and you know, let's, let's do the timings again. So we go from 24 nanoseconds to, this is 400. So actually, for some reason, it's able to, with only this information, it does actually less optimizations. It's kind of curious. Sometimes it can be hard to, to know what how much it actually can optimize code um, when it only has partial information. Sometimes partial information is actually worse because it can make it guess incorrectly more often. Um, this seems to be such a case. It seems like it's, it's actually probably going to be, let's actually take a look at this, at code LLVM, let's see if it's readable. I'd have to dig in a lot more to figure out why it's a little bit loss optimal. But my guess is that 
it it is like having a, a smaller set of functions that it can choose from because it kind of knows that it should be a floating point number and um, actually this one's a little curious but there, there, this is not the only case where, where that will show up. So sometimes partial, partial information is actually even worse for a compiler. Having total information is always better, but partial information can actually be worse. So there are some times when you have to have type instabilities, right? Because there's not, there are these cases. Like for example, um, if you read from a file, right? You read from a file, the file tells you 2.0. Now you know it's, it's a float 64. When you open up the file, you don't necessarily know what kind of type you're going to have. So therefore, th that form of file I.O. can necessarily have a type instability. And what's the effective way to deal with that type instability? Uh, one, one way to do this is with what's called a function barrier. So take this code. Now let's um, take this code, which is a floating point, a, a vector flow 64, let's time this. Let me, um, so, oh yeah, so we, so we define this to be a vector of numbers, right? So this is a vector of numbers, and this is something that's going to be very slow because uh, it's going to be very slow because every single time it does this operation, it is going to not know what the type that comes out is, and then it's going to have to, you know, this is this is an arbitrary number, this is an arbitrary number, everything actually becomes any, right? So this is type inference gone bad. Well, let's actually let's let's actually look at a small modification to this function. So instead of calling r of x, let's call s of x equals underscore s of the first thing, the second thing, underscore s of the two things does the same function call, right? Is this going to be slower or faster? The answer's on the screen, so you should know, but it's going to be a whole lot faster. Why is that the case? Well, if we think about exactly how the compiler is working here, right, then remember that Julia functions will always specialize on the types. So the function here is a function that takes in a vector of numbers. Now when I do here, what comes out is a number and what comes out is a number. But in this specific case, it's two floating point numbers, right? And so when I do this function call, then it'll special specialize on the, on, the, on the types that it has right here, which is float64 and float64. So inside of this function, it is then a function of float64, float64, and inside of here, it's fast. So let me walk through that a little uh, again, because it's, it's, a, it's a little bit tricky. Um, so here, it has a vector of numbers, right? When I go into this function, it's a vector of numbers. You do not know the type here. You do not know the type here. But when you do a function call in Julia, right, you do all this, this nonsense to figure out what your current type is to be able to specialize the function and call the specific function. So here, it, lo it looks at the, you know, it looks at this, this number type, it goes to the heap, it finds its, its thing, and given our current value of, of x, it sees that the thing is going to be a float64. And it goes right here and finds out this is a float64. And so then it calls underscore s specialized on only for float64, float64 values. So then this loop is type stable. What comes out of here, what comes out of here is, you know, you know that what comes, the inferred type of underscore s float64, float64 is float64. But the inferred type of s is unknown because you did not know before what version of this s underscore s you were going to call. So you do have a little bit of type instability to be able to figure out what the types are going to be, but then inside of your main function, everything is fast because you will have hit a function barrier that then sh shortens your functions to, or your, your types to their concrete versions. So this is known as a function barrier. This is, so if you have a, a container which has a lot of, which is concrete, which is not concretely typed, right? You can have strings and everything in there. Then the next function that you call on the output will be something that has to do the computations to be able to figure out what the type is. So if you do one big function call around the, the outputs of that array, then you can do a gigantic calculation in there and you can kind of, 
amortize out that that cost of, of dispatch um, so this right here is called a dynamic dispatch because you dynamically have to figure out which function to call and then all of your function calls inside of here are static dispatches because you know the type now and so therefore you're able to deduce exactly what functions you should be calling at each step of the way this is then fully type stable in the whole computation and because we're doing so many more computations here it ends up making it so that way it's almost as fast as if you were to have the type stable version in the first place so function barrier is a very nice, it, it's a trick. It, it's basically using these ideas that we've been building up about type inference. It's using them all together and it's using the way the compiler works to be able to give you a programming style to turn type, to turn functions that don't have type inference to functions that have mostly type inference. So yeah, I did kind of show this example before. So here is a function um, that has f of x. And if x is an integer, it does something. If otherwise, it does something else. And it does x plus y, right? Now, remember I mentioned that, you know, that we had that case where we had a random number choose which output. Here we have the type information choose an output. Type information is known at compile time. So at compile time, when we build a function based off of f of f, there is no branch. Right, so when we put in 5 here, 5 is an integer, and so y is equal to 2, and so we have 5 plus 2, and this will actually output, this, this will do an integer add between 5 and 2. Whereas when I put in here 2.0, this is something where x is not an integer, and so y equals 4, and so it actually is doing a, a add between the thing that comes in and the constant value 4. Right. So it will have comp this this loop actually completely goes away. It compiles away. It gets deleted. And so if you're using things that are based on type information, feel free to you know have other branches and stuff. It's not going to make your code slower because if it can actually prove that one branch is is, is happening, then it will compile away and delete the other branch. And that, we've actually seen this in a few of our benchmarks earlier, where I accidentally put in you know like compile time information for what some of the inputs are and actually use that to completely delete all my code, right? Because, you know, this was this case where I did, you know, b time of g of uh, complex of 1.0, 1.0, complex of 1.0, 1.0, where when it, when it was then calling this, it was like, oh, if this is a compiler constant I can specialize on, this is a compiler constant I can specialize on, your function's simple enough, I'm going to compile the version that gives the answer. Right, it doesn't even run any computations anymore, and that's why I pulled out these values here because I, I wanted to benchmark it and actually benchmark its calculations. Where whereas if you give it the constant information, it can specialize based off of those values or those types because you know it, those those pi nodes, those constants can show up as literals inside of there. So um, this this brings us to one of the key details to really understand about Julia. And it's that if you do a loop at the global scope, so a equals rand of 100 by 100, uh, b equals rand of 100 by 100, c equals rand of 100 by 100. And you do this, you're going to get a very, very, very slow function. Why is that the case? Well, because all of this type inference, all of this types specialization happens inside of functions. So here, the function the function that is called is get index, function that is called is get index, function that is called is plus, function that is called is set index, and then loop again. All right, so this has a ton of function calls at the top level. Nothing is able to be inferred because everything is a global variable where some somewhere like in the 50th iteration, I could interactively in the REPL have changed what the value would be it to be a string, right? So it cannot specialize in anything. So if we put this as something that's directly in the REPL, it has no type information and it's slow because you can interactively change the types whenever you want. If we take that same code and then we define um, function f of a, b, c, Right, now we do that b time f of a, b, c. This is a whole lot faster because 
it is able to do to do you know it, it takes the time to do the JIT compilation of this whole function, and it figures out that this input type is float 64, float 64, float 64, and then that means that what comes out here is float 64, which means what you add here, like let's actually look at the code, code LLVM, what you add here is going to be. Ooh, that's actually a bit more than I thought it was going to be. Let me see if I can quickly find the. Yeah, so a lot of where the complexity is actually coming in is because of the definition of these ranges right here. Um, but yeah, so what it's, what it's actually doing is it's, it's actually going to decompose the code here into having this value. So it's going to do this add operation, and then it's going to do this operation of putting it into this memory. This is OK because this is stack allocated, because we know the number of bits. We, we, we've, you could figure out the types by doing this type inference, whereas in this other case, it cannot know the number of bits. So it's actually it's going to be heap allocating what comes out, heap allocating what comes out, heap allocating this, and then putting it into the next array. Um, so that's actually why that other form, that's actually why this form, if you look at what it says, it says that it just has a ton of allocations. That's where a lot of these allocations come from. Everything has to get heap allocated, and then it needs to dynamically figure out what the type is again in order to figure out what functions to call. The other thing that, that's coming out of this function is that because it knows the bit sizes, it's actually doing operations with two different numbers all at the same time. We're do, seeing this SIMD again. We'll define SIMD at another time because this is already a long lecture. Um, but it, it's able to do multiple computations on different parts of the data at the same time. So what are, so what are the actual overheads of different operations, right? So now that we, we know how to work with memory, we know how to make things fast by, um, by using all the type information available, by compiler information and making that optimize, what are the last things that we need to do in order to make everything fast? Well, the thing to know is really what are the overheads of your individual operations. So simple arithmetic, like floating point operations, take about one clock cycle, which is like four or five nanoseconds. That's actually how I knew that when it spit out to me that it was 0 0.001 nanoseconds, that is faster than anything that's possible. I don't think I'll be able to find that now. But what, what the, so if you have to do each floating point operation is going to be one clock cycle or a few nanoseconds. If, now, if you can use a SIMD vector, you can do two or four or eight uh, floating point operations or uh, simple arithmetic operations all at the same time. And so it's not necessarily that, you know, you, you can't count the number of floating point operations to know what the, the total time will be because SIMD is definitely one of these things that will get in the way. An interesting thing that comes up is that uh, a, a branch prediction is fairly expensive. So if a is greater than b, well, so branch is, is expensive, excuse me, um, else y, right? So this, this type of operation is extremely expensive. It's about 10 to 20 clock cycles, so it costs a lot more than the actual cost of doing floating point operations. So you should try to avoid it unless it's able to predict what's going on. So if you keep on having a is greater than b, your processor will start to do the computation of this branch and it'll continue on all of its computations before it actually finishes doing this, this, uh, this conditional because it is, so, it is so much faster to do the floating point operations than it is to actually calculate this conditional. So that's what's called branch prediction. It will take one branch and it will just continue all of your computations. If, it, if that is true, then it will just use all the computations it did. If that is false, then it'll go back and you'll use the correct value that comes out. So if you're if you have everything already pre-sorted, if you uh, if you have everything pre-sorted or you're working on very homogeneous values, you can find that your your processor starts to be able to predict how what will happen inside of these floating point operations, and they essentially become you know one clock cycle cost. They they basically go away. So um, branch predictions are expensive on or branches are expensive unless they're able to be predicted. Function calls are extremely expensive. They're 15 to 60 clock cycles. So how come we're able to do a function like this S so fast if it takes so many clock cycles to do this call? Well, 
when we actually looked at all this generated code, there is no, you, you don't see the, the spot where LLVM is actually calling um, underscore S anymore, or it's, you don't see it calling F anymore. What the compiler does is it realizes that F is really cheap, and so it replaces F with what it, how it was defined, and it replaces that with the LLVM call directly. Right? And so this, this idea of deleting these functions and, and changing them into their primitive forms is called inlining. So by default, there is a cost model within the, within the Julia compiler, and there's a cost model within the C++ compiler and Fortran compilers, which is trying to figure out whether something is cheaper than, you know, say, 60 clock cycles worth of cost. And if it's cheap enough, then what it will try to do is every single time it sees this function, it will delete the function call, and it will stick the actual code in there instead of calling the function. Um, the re so there's a trade-off there, right, because it makes your function bigger, so your compile times can increase. But if your function is cheap enough, then that will get rid of this very expensive cost. So, so if you want to force inlining or make inlining more likely to happen, you can always do at inline uh, function, you know, f of dix. So this is what this at inline means. If you start to see this in packages or inside of uh, base code, what this is really trying to do is it's giving a hint to the compiler that it should be deleting this function and just pasting this code in um, anywhere it can. And, and the last thing is that RAM reads are very expensive, and so you know, this is the same thing I was mentioning before. Um, I mentioned already about this balance checking, right, where the, the reason why a lot of this stuff is very complicated is because a lot of this code is just checking to see whether things are actually in the boundary of the array. So, I, so you can delete a lot of the operations that have to be calculated by doing this inbounds. So now it no longer has to calculate, find out whether it's in the array. And now it's directly going straight to the computations. And remember, that is something that can speed up the calculations quite a bit. Well, let's actually do the timing here. So here we have one version which is, has the bounds checking on. We have another version which has the bounds checking off, right? Could we, when we call at inbounds, we're turning it off explicitly. Why is this something we turn off? Well, because we could be changing any value in our entire computer right here. We can actually cause seg faults. We can cause our computer to shut down, right? So that's why it's not on by default. But if you do want to turn it off, you can make things quite a bit faster. Um, and one of the things that happens here is more SIMD can happen. So let's actually look at the generated code for what happens for this other case. And hopefully it'll look like what my notes are saying. So aha, uh -huh, this is what you see here. So what this is doing, this, this stores, is actually seeing that now that we have no bounds checks, right? So in this code, in the, the, the code that you see here is not saying everything, right? Because the code that we see here, the first thing that it'll do is it'll check whether j times the size of a times, you know, the is going to be within bounds. So if it's in bounds, then do this. Otherwise, so there's a, there's a branch here. It's going to make a branch prediction to be fast, but it doesn't actually know which branch will be true, so it can't start to connect operations. Here, there is no branch checking. It knows, ex if, it, if you have it i and j, it knows exactly where in the memory to go. And it knows that if we did it in, in this order, that the that the next four operations will actually be the next four th values of the array. So it knows that we're going to be using, it knows that we're using everything in order, and it knows that everything is just going to be pluses after each other. It's plus, 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 whereas this one was if, plus, if, plus, if, plus. So now that we have all of our pluses aligned, it realizes that it can do, for, it, can, it can, instead of doing plus, 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 it can build a vector, so this is a, a SIMD vector. It can build a SIMD vector of size 4, and it can add four numbers at a time. And this is what we're seeing inside of the SIMD. So this is single input multiple data. 
you have these registers inside of your floating point oper uh, inside of your your chip, your your FPUs, and also on integers, which are big, bigger than there was required for 64-bit number, because it is able to do four operations at a time. If you have one of the even newer chips, then it, uh, then you have AVX 512, and it can do 512 bits of operations all simultaneously. Um, so the very highly optimized libraries are trying to use as SIMD as much as possible, because you're basically getting free speed. Um, is there are there any more cases of this right so this is this is the case where if you just try to count the number of multiplies or the number of ads you do you're you're going to get the wrong number because your computer is you know decreasing the total number of ads it has to do because it's doing four at a time another case where this happens is fuse multiply ad so if you look at the llvm for uh, fuse multiply ad you see that there is this thing which is double which has three numbers that come in and these three numbers do this operation of multiply and add. This does two things, actually. For, for one, if you do a multiplication, then you do an add. Then you actually have round off error that can occur between the multiplication and the addition step. Right? So, uh, this is, so FMA is actually more accurate. But also, this computation is just one computation. So, this is, you know, so FMA is one computation. This is two operations. Right, so if we're trying to decrease the number of, of cycles that we're using, decrease the number of floating point operations, this one will be cheaper than this one. And now it can be processor dependent. And so you, know, you might want to do MOLAD and MOLAD and MOLAD, where MOLAD, what this will do is it is a version for specific to Julia, which will look at a person's, uh, in the compiler, they will look at the person's um, architecture and if the architecture of a cert is a certain kind where this FMA operation is fast, then it will use FMA. If the person has a much older uh, chip, then FMA is not actually implemented on the chip, but it's implemented in software, and the software version is slower. Um, because it, the software version is trying to get the accuracy of this fuse multiply add, but without actually having the single operation on the chip. It ends up taking more operations than two. So. Um, so MOLAD is this kind of this chip safe way, which is uh, given someone's architecture, it'll choose whichever one is the fastest. Um, now, this is again where where macros come into play because here we have MOLAD macro.jl, which defines this macro. Where let's kind of look at one of these operations, right? So. Technically, this has a fuse multiply add here, and then you have a fuse multiply add, and you have a fuse multiply add. You don't want to be doing this all by hand, right? And so this is a perfect case where you can write a program that takes in this expression and creates a new expression, which is the version that is calling molad in the right ways. Right? So you can see that here, here's the more optimized version, which is going to do molad between um, this value, this value, and the multiplication of these two values. So there's one molad going on in here, then there's a nested molad on the outside, and there's a molad going on over here, right? Because this is an infuse multiply add. There is, if you multiply these two things together, then you get a fuse multiply add, and then you get multiply this times this plus this, right? So these are things that you, you, you could write it all out by hand, but this, what this uh, molad macro.jl does is if you have these kinds of, of codes that's writing out a lot of, um, that, that's writing out a lot of, what's the word, um, uh, dot product kinds of code, you know, a lot of linear operations. Um, so for example, doing a polynomial evaluation, then this thing can kind of just search for where all the molad operations should be and decrease the total number of floating point operations you're doing, right? And actually make it more accurate. So here I, I did mention inlining, right? Where um, you what it, what it's doing is it's really just pasting in the code and deleting the actual function call cost because that is one of the primitive things that costs a lot of time. So that is a whole lot of information on making your uh, your serial code uh, faster. So yeah, that's this is probably the most in depth that you if you've never seen this before. This is a very large amount of of um, information, please go through these notes multiple times. You you probably won't get all the information without playing with it, right? So these are things that will come second nature sooner or later. Don't worry if you don't remember every little trick, 
really the thing to understand is if you understand a lot of these higher level architecture details, then you can kind of deduce what should be fast and what should be slow just by thinking about what kind of information do I have? Can I deduce what the bits are? Am I doing heap allocations? Um, am I doing everything in a way such that if the compiler wanted to delete operations, it could? And am I trying to reduce the total number of floating point operations I'm doing by fusing my multiplies with additions and fusing multiple additions together? So, very. So this is probably going to be this section right here is probably one of one of the longest you know parts that is very detailed. But ho hopefully, um, after you take this, our first homework assignment will be asking you to write some optimized dynamical system code, and you'll really have to start to take this to heart. And I think that's 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 when you'll really learn all the details.